one that we all love as we sing about how awesome God is. So I want you to think about the things that he's done in your life, the things he brought you out of. And I want you to sing this song with all your heart as we sing together. Welcome to the DFW Church. My name is Joshua Hose, and this is my wife, Sarah, and we're part of the Central Worship Center. We're so glad that you decided to join us for our time of worship this morning. 
Good morning to all of you and welcome to our visitors. If you are new to our church, we thank you so much for deciding to worship with us today. I hope this service is encouraging and inspiring to your walk with God. You know, as we continue our time of worship, let us begin with a word of prayer. Holy Father, we just want to thank you for this time to be able to be united and to draw closer to you. Through our time of worship, we pray that it's honoring to you and honoring to those who hear it. And we pray that we'll allow it to draw us closer to you. Thank you again for all that you do. Continue to be with us. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now let's check out the Kids' Corner this morning. Welcome to Kids' Corner. We're the Delacruz family. I'm Randy. I'm Jennifer. I'm Kalita. I'm Madeline. I'm Bookson. I'm Nathaniel. I'm Elizabeth. And this is Abigail. Today we want to share with you the scripture from 1 Corinthians 13, 4. It says, Love is not proud. Now before we sing today, I wanted to talk a little bit about what love is not proud means. So, what does it mean to be proud? It means being boastful or thinking you're better than everyone else. Is that, is that a good thing to be proud this way? No. no. So what is the opposite of proud? That's in being <laughs> humble. And who should we be humble like? Mm -hmm. Like little children. Little children, right? So, who is the most childlike in our family, Elizabeth? Abigail. Abigail. Does she like to sing? Yes. yes. Does she? Yes. So, does she like to little, sing little children's songs? Yes. yes. So, should we be too proud to sing little children's songs like Abigail? No. No. Should you be too proud to sing little children's songs to Jesus? No. no. All right, I hope you join us. Now, this is an easy song, but it does have actions. I hope you join in. The name of the song is He's the Lord of the Sunshine. Ready? He's the Lord of the sunshine, the Lord of the rain. He's the Lord of the good times, the Lord of the pain. He's the Lord of the mountains, the Lord of the sea. He's the Lord of the music, the Lord of the children. The Lord of you and me. One more time. He's the Lord of the sunshine, the Lord of the rain. He's the Lord of the good times, the Lord of the pain. He's the Lord of the mountains, the Lord of the sea. He's the Lord of the music, the Lord of the children, the Lord of you and me. That was great. How else can we show that love is not proud? How about serving instead of thinking it's someone else's job or that it's below you? Okay, bye. That was Jamal. He just asked us to do a Kids Corner video. <laughs> That's what you get for saying you never wanted to do one of those. Hmm. I think love is not proud also means not insisting on doing things my way. Okay, you're right. Let's do it the way you suggested. Or caring less about how we look in front of others. I just want to be pretty for the video. Remember, Elizabeth, God cares more about what you look like on the inside. Love is not proud means you can also ask for help. What do I say again when Daddy asked me the question? You say that we need to be humble, like little children. Oh. For me, it's saying sorry when I've sinned. Sorry for being prideful earlier and saying I could do a better job on the video than you. It was wrong of me. Do you forgive me? Yes. So you see, we got to uh, practice that love is not proud today. We hope that you get to do the same at your home or school or work this week. Thanks for learning with us. Have, Have a love, love is not, not proud day. day. P.S. Love is not proud also means you're willing to share your mistakes. Welcome to Kids Corner. Love is not proud means also you can help for Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I spoke a word. 
What an uplifting worship service so far. The sermon this morning is entitled Unity, Jesus' Dying Request, and Alan Gower will be preaching. Let's join together in one more song before the lesson. Let's worship God as we sing together how great God is. He is a good God.
Good morning. My name is Alan Gower, and I'm so grateful to be with you here this morning. As you can see, I'm wearing a sling. And three weeks ago, I had surgery on my rotator cuff. I was mountain biking with my son, Trey. He hit a jump and landed it. I hit the same jump and crashed into a tree. I'm now in the throes of physical therapy, and it hurts. I'm working hard, moving and stretching my shoulder to strengthen and heal. I'm having to stretch ligaments and muscles that have shrunk, and it can be painful. But if I want my shoulder to work in harmony with my body, I have to put the work in even when it hurts. All this has made me think about my Christianity, our Christianity. At one time, if we call ourselves disciples of Christ, we were baptized and proclaimed Jesus is Lord, and the Holy Spirit started doing surgery on our hearts. And to this day, we work to grow and change to be more like Jesus. We're always in spiritual, physical therapy. And we, as the patient, have to put in the effort, put in the hard work in order to continue to grow and change. We stretch the ligaments of our hearts, and sometimes it's hard, and it hurts. Often there's pain, but other times maybe not as much. And this brings me to my topic this morning, unity. Jesus' dying request. You know, it's been a few months, but the last couple of times I was with you, we talked about something that is so, so important, something we should keep in the forefront of our minds. And in the worship center my wife and I lead, it's even our 2021 theme, What Does Love Require of Me? In other words, how does love live itself out in our lives? Along with that, we talked about anger, the antithesis of love. You might remember the lesson entitled, You Mad Bro? Well, this morning, this theme of unity follows along with this theme of what does love require of me. One that we find in Psalm 133, and really, we find it all over the Bible. But Psalm 133 is where we'll start and end our time today. In the Psalms, there are are a number of songs, each one of them written for a different reason. Some lament, some commemorate a moment of joy, or beg God to intervene. Well, Psalm 133 is no different, although it is a part of what is called the Psalms of Ascension. Now, these songs were meant to be sung while traveling to Jerusalem. And just about anywhere you traveled from in the Mediterranean world, you were traveling upward toward Jerusalem. And so these psalms were meant to be sung as you ascended to Jerusalem. When heading to a feast or heading to worship in Jerusalem, people would use these songs to elevate their hearts, even as they were physically gaining in elevation. So let's start our time together this morning in Psalm 133, which just happens to be one of my favorites. I remember my wife framed this for me to put in my single brother's apartment many years ago. And it says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. You know, of course, the key to this psalm, the main thrust, the big idea or the drive of the song here is unity. And one definition of unity is many coming together to form and to act our lead as one. And we're going to discover and be reminded about the power of unity today. All throughout Scripture, we see that unity is part of God's plan. And all throughout the Scriptures, we're urged to fight for unity. Even in the Bible, you can see it's not easy, and it's not something that just happens on its own. It takes intentional effort. And let me give you a few examples. In Colossians 3.14, it says, And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And Paul is telling the church in Colossae that you've got to fight to keep love at the center of everything. And that's going to allow the church to live in unity. Well, Ephesians 4.3 says, I want you to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The endeavor, or to endeavor, is a verb, an action word. It means you are striving or 
working really hard. And, and God wants us to work really hard to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Well, let's break it down a bit more here. Because our default is chaos. Everyone does their own thing. Everyone marches to the beat of their own drum. And unity is not our default. And I really believe that it's going to take us as Christians to be a light, to show the world a better way. We should live differently than the world lives. It will take work and love, but we can live in harmony, united together. Unity was something that was very important to Jesus. In fact, just before Jesus died on the cross, he prayed one last prayer, and we find it in John 17. He says, Father, I pray that they are one as we are one. What was on his heart at the end? Well, it was unity. And Jesus said that he and God are one, and they are also one with the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is the greatest example of unity. It's the gold standard. The Trinity does different things in different ways, and yet all coming together as one for a common purpose, a common theme, a common goal, a common direction, a common drive to bring us to a deeper relationship with God and each other. And Jesus is saying the way He is united with God and the Spirit is how He hopes and desires the church will be united as one. Tragically, we don't often see this in the local churches. And that turns us off to what God's family truly can be. And I might add, it makes Satan very happy. Unity was Jesus' dying request. And I like how author Rick Warren puts it. It is your job to protect the unity of your church. Unity in the church is so important that the New Testament gives it more attention than either heaven or hell. God deeply desires that we experience oneness and harmony with each other. Unity is the soul of fellowship. Destroy it, and you rip the heart out of Jesus' body. These are strong words, but unity is something God takes so seriously. So seriously that in Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, He made a list of all the things He hates. Included in this list is the person who sows discord in a family. God hates the behavior of someone who tries to disrupt and destroy the unity of the family. And we find discord in this light right next to murder and deceit. These are strong words. But unity is something God takes so seriously. So seriously that in Proverbs 6, verse 16 through 19, He made a list of all the things He hates. Included in this list is the person who sows discord in a family. God hates the behavior of someone who tries to disrupt and destroy the unity of the family. We find discord in this list right next to murder and deceit. What is important to God should be important to us as well. Because where there is division, there is weakness. Where there is unity, there is strength. No doubt unity is important within the church, but it is important everywhere. We need unity between us and God. We need unity in our marriages. Unity is important and essential within a family, on any team, in any company, where there is more than one person moving toward a cause or toward fulfilling something. Unity is essential. And the devil attacks unity vigorously and vehemently. If he can divide, he can conquer. He'll try to get between a husband and a wife the moment you say, I do. His desire is to get you to say, I don't. His goal is to build factions and cause discord. And Satan does this with friends. How quickly he can get us to turn on each other through simple misunderstandings. He does this in the political arena today. We can get so caught up that we forget that we are Christians first. We as Christians can get caught up in the political onslaught, harsh words on social media, choosing to drive each other further apart just to prove a point. We allow ourselves to get caught up in the banter, and people see this, but do they see Jesus? Are you different than the world? 
The enemy is always trying to get us to divide. And that is why we have to fight for unity without ceasing. So what does it actually take to be unified? Before talking about the blessings or the effects of unity in Psalm 133, let's talk about the price tag for a minute because there could be sticker shock when we actually face up to what it takes to get to unity. And I have three words this morning that are building blocks to unity that we find in the Bible. Humility, trust, and tenacity. But before we get into this, I want to share a story about a friend of mine, Raymond Clone. It was December 1994 and I was living in Pacific Beach in San Diego. And at the time I owned three big old tire stores with two partners. I had met Raymond about a year earlier after he had set up his makeshift home underneath a tractor trailer in the back of our store. You see, Raymond was homeless. At first, I wasn't sure if I wanted one of the many homeless in the area living in the back of my store. But as time went by, Raymond and I built a friendship. He was a 62-year-old black man from Georgia. I was a 26-year-old from Northern California. But that didn't stop us from talking and realizing that we had a number of things in common. We both loved baseball and both had played in college. We both loved to surf. We each had a deep love for music and singing. Every few days I would go behind the shop and, and if Raymond was home, he would come out from underneath the trailer and we'd spend some time talking. Sometimes I would go across the street, grab some carne asada burritos from Roberto's and Raymond and I would sit out back and talk while eating lunch together. We would talk about baseball, the teams we loved, and the players from the past. We would talk about how the surf was that day and where the best places were to surf in San Diego. And it was actually because of him that I found some of my favorite places to surf. He would take out an old guitar and we would sing together while he played. One day, there was a knock on the back of my door of my shop. It was one of Raymond's friends who was also homeless. He informed me that Raymond was pretty sick and that he and a few of his friends were going to be bringing Raymond back to the trailer. Well, I was worried for what would happen to Raymond at this point. But what happened next was something I never expected. Over the next three weeks, I watched as upwards of 30 different homeless people made their way to the back of my shop to make sure that Raymond was okay. They would bring him food, medicine, or just a smiling face. At times, I would step out the back door of the shop and I would see up to five different people sitting back there taking care of Raymond. At no time was Raymond ever alone. What I saw from this group of people was when one of their own was down and out, they were willing to be there for their friend. I had seen many of these people before. In fact, I knew quite a few of them. But I never thought that I would see them do what they did to the degree that they did. They rallied around Raymond and made sure that he was nursed back to health. I, I saw something very different, a unity that I had not seen in quite a long time. You know, it'd be the next month, January 1995, that somebody would invite me to church. It took me until March to finally attend, but I was baptized two weeks later. It was in the church that I would experience love and unity, unlike any other. A unity born out of a love for Jesus. You know, the first word the first building block of unity we find back in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, where Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Paul says there is a way that we walk as Christians. He says in verse 2, with all humility. Well, there it is, humility. It takes humility to get to unity. Why? Because in order for lots of people from multiple backgrounds to come together, like in the church, we have to be humble. I mean, look at our church and, 
in our 1200 plus group, we have so many different people from different parts of the world. It's amazing to me to see the diversity, black and white, Asian, Hispanic, just to name a few. We've all come from different places. We've all been raised differently. We've different experiences, come from different cultures. We have different life traps and hang-ups, but we also have the Word. And for people to come together and unite, there has to be humility because when we become Christians, we choose to set ourselves aside for something greater. Well, humility says it's not about me. Humility recognizes the power that each of us brings to the table to make a team, to make a family, to unite a group as a people with one singular focus and bond by one singular gift, the blood of Christ. Unity doesn't mean uniformity. We've heard this in weeks past. We are all different. We are all given different personalities, different spiritual gifts, and we are all called to, called to come together not to lay aside our uniqueness, but to use our uniqueness as we accept the uniqueness of others in pursuit of something bigger than we are. Humility doesn't desire everyone else to be like me or me like you. Together we are one, we make a whole. You know, in a marriage, it can be easy to resent the uniqueness of our spouse. Laura and I are very different. I'm loud, a people person, artsy, and I can think very abstract. Laura is detailed on top of everything, is an introvert who still loves people. And Laura has many strengths and talents, but more often than not in years past, I have chosen to focus on her weaknesses and her shortcomings because they were not mine. But what I forgot is that God has put two people together so that they can complement each other. We help each other in our weaknesses and together we make a whole person. In the church, we must leverage our strengths to humbly serve each other in God. We each bring something to the table there is not a one of us who isn't here for a reason. We all play a part in God's design for the church in the DFW area. This is how unity works. Each person being willing to have a humble heart to serve, give and believe that God can work through me, you, and each of us together for His good. The second word we need to build unity is trust. Within the family, within the team, within our church, we need to continue to grow a spirit of trust. You know, Satan works overtime to disable our trust, doesn't he? He works to create and grow a culture of suspicion where the first inclination is, why did they say that that way? Or look at me that way. Why are they talking to me about this? Is, is she talking about me to other people? How come they never call me? Why does he think that way? We can be unwilling to give the benefit of the doubt, to think the best. Isn't it easy to think of the negative first? Don't we often judge what we think someone else is thinking? What they do or say or don't do and don't say? Of late, it's been easy to mistrust. But only when trust exists can there be a kind of vulnerability that is needed to grow past the surface into a, the deeper parts of who we are as people. You know, continuing in chapter 4, we see words like gentleness, patience, and bearing with. Well, let's read verses 1 through 3 here. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility. And we just talked about that. And then he says, in gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Well, these three words have within the connotation of a trusting God to live in such a way. And the quickest way for Satan to mess with our trust with each other is to get us to take 
our eyes off of Jesus, off of God, to not trust in the Trinity. We can't function properly without being tapped into the power source, into our power source. What our world needs right now is a group of people who are willing to lay down this trust, to ask questions, to assume the best, to stay tapped into the power of God. Because in the world, Satan is doing a masterful job of pitting one group against another, one person against another. We see it in politics. We see it in race. We see it in culture. We see it everywhere. Christianity needs to be a sanctuary, the place where trust is valued. We have a common faith and a common theme that unifies us unlike any other, the blood of Christ. No doubt, the challenges of COVID have found ways to pick away at our trust. When we are not as connected, it is so much easier to let things that are said are done get in there and mess with us, mess with our unity. We lose the heart Paul calls us to have, the gentleness, the patience, and bearing with each other because we lose focus and unity with God. I'm not naive enough to think that we haven't had reasons that would grow mistrust in this church. The church is made up of us, imperfect people. Things happen. Things will be said. Things will be done or not done that can lead to losing trust. Don't let it. Do we want to allow Christ's love to compel us, or do we want to let Satan direct our lives? You know, back to verse 3 of Ephesians 4, Paul is asking us to be endeavoring to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Remember, to be eager or to endeavor means striving or trying to work really hard. A synonym for endeavor or to try is tenacity, which is my third word. Tenacity. I want to go back to my story of Raymond for a minute. You know, I remember asking one of Raymond's friends who brought his medicine, where did they get the money for it? A few days later, that same friend came by the shop and asked if I wanted to go see what was done to get Raymond's medicine. So we left the shop and we ended up at a plasma bank where two of Raymond's other friends were giving plasma that day. They had a year earlier set up to give plasma every month and would use that money to live off of each month. But not this month. This month, they would take all of this money, pool it together along with additional money that they got walking through the streets of Pacific Beach, begging for money, and bought Raymond's medicine. This is tenacity. This is grit. This is not indifference or a casualness to it. Think about marriage vows. In sickness and in health, richer or poor, for better or for worse, till death do us part. How often do we remind ourselves of these vows? These vows take tenacity. What about the vows we made when we put on Christ in baptism? We made Jesus both Savior and Lord, or Master. What does love require of me? Love asks us to fight for unity. It requires the tenacity to contend, to stay faithful, the tenacity to contend for each other, the tenacity to fight for our unity. Because where there is division, there is weakness. But where there is unity, there is strength. I'm going to jump back to where we began this whole journey in Psalm 133. Our desire for humility, trust, and tenacity breathes life into this psalm. And so let's break it down for a minute. How good and pleasant it is. You know, there's just something about life where people are at peace with each other, right? Isn't it awesome when you're all getting along, happy, connected? But it's unrealistic to think and expect that there's not going to be difficult times and conversations. But if we are able to walk through these times with humility, with trust and tenacity, then we can find joy and peace on the other side. We've got to care more about the relationship being right 
than us being right. We must commit to empathy and to being emotionally intelligent, to using our words well and trying to see through each other's eyes, even having the strength to say sorry first. It takes humility, trust, and tenacity to lead to peace in our relationships. And God says, this is good and this is pleasant. David goes on to say, when we dwell in unity. In other words, it's where we live. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. You know, there are so many things we could say about this, but I want to bring one idea to light. This oil that Moses used to anoint Aaron was made especially for that purpose and in accordance with God's specifications. This oil was to be poured profusely upon Aaron, even to the point that it dripped from his beard and fell on the border of his collar of his robe. So much oil was used that all those who were witnessing the event could easily see it, much like people should see our unity. And not only could they see it, but they could smell its sweet fragrance. Unity among the people of God is always fragrant. It makes us appealing to unbelievers, but the odor of disunity will drive them away. And in verse 3, it is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. In other words, where unity is present, it's like morning dew that is refreshing. Because water is a vital source of life, much like our unity brings a vital source of life to those around us. It falls on those around us. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. What a powerful ending to this psalm, life forevermore. You know, we have to understand how much the Holy Spirit dislikes discord and unity. It is an affront to His very nature. And there's so many powerful examples in the Bible where the Holy Spirit does amazing work in those who desire unity. Think about Nehemiah, how many came together to build a wall. It was tried before for years and could not be done, but they were able to do it in 52 days. Why? Because the Bible says they were united as one man. The book of Acts in chapter 2 says the same thing. They came together in one accord, and the Holy Spirit powered their efforts and blessed their unity. They all lifted up the name of Jesus, and what happened? They planted churches all over the Roman Empire and were known as people who, were turned, who turned the world upside down. They were a group of people chasing a common cause with a trust, a humility, and a tenacity to make a difference. Because where there is division, there is weakness. But where there is unity, there is strength. So what does love require of me? What is love calling each of us to do today? Fight, fight, fight for our unity. Grow what is strong and don't wait to right the wrongs. You know, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, he says, Two are better than one. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. We're better together. Be humble. Choose to trust and work hard at unity. And let's keep our focus always on God, His Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because where there is unity, there is strength. And this is what love requires of me, because unity was Jesus' dying request. Thanks, Alan. We appreciate the reminder. I know so much uh, it's easy to lose sight of unity especially in all that's going on. And just as Jesus reminded us in his last words, 
that we would be one just as He and the Father are one. I pray as well that God would guide us and help us to stay unified in the midst of all that's been going on. Thanks for that reminder, Alan. We are so glad you joined us in worship this morning. If you would like more information about the DFW Church, you can find us on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Or log on to our official website at the link below. You know, at this time, we want to encourage everyone to join their small group for a time of communion and fellowship with one another. Again, have a great Sunday, everyone.
to Zion from their freedom came a scheme and while the city lay in ruins we believed they had a dream when our soul Spirit moves on. Gen-